Real Vision Daily Briefing, live without a net. It's TG Tuesday. Tony Greer, welcome back. Slash Pennington, how are we doing today, man? Oh, I'm doing great, man. Totally psyched to do this show. Always enjoy this. By the way, I should say, it's a lot of fun doing these with you every other Tuesday, live on YouTube, live on the platform. It's just really fun. I think people are getting to know us. We're finding an entirely new audience here. They're getting to know us. We're getting to know them. I just really enjoy doing these with you, Tony. So do I. I booked every other Tuesday out 10 years, Ash. I'm ready to go. Awesome. I'll see you until 2032. No problem. Let's jump right in. I got to be honest with you, man. Just between you and me, I have literally been in the crypto weeds for the, it's basically since the weekend, since the volatility started happening uh, in Bitcoin. Talk to me, Tony. What am I missing in capital markets? Be my Sherpa. Walk me through. Oh, OK. Well, if you want to go into the regular markets now, back from your futuristic electric money world for a moment, if we will. Um, you know, I think the major thing for me coming into this week is that we survived that massive inflation scare last week, right? I was thinking about having- Set, set that up for us, Tony, for people who didn't watch those prints come back. Yeah, so last week we got that big, um, you know, in headline inflation number where we got, you know, the scary number that we got a 0.9% month over month rise in X food and energy CPI. Right. That 0.9 percent gain was the biggest month over month gain in CPI X food and energy since 1981. Right. So what happened when that uh, headline number hits the tape now, this is the first headline, the whiff of real headline inflation that we're getting in the CPI data. So what happens is you've got the market based inflation expectations start absolutely quivering right to the highs. Right. They see it on the tape and now they have no choice but to have these large magnitude inflation anticipation moves. What, what did you see there, by the way, for people who don't follow these? Talk a little bit about what those moves are that respond. Yeah. So we've been watching very closely, Ash. Um, for example, the yield curve, twos, tens, fives, bonds, things like that. They've been progressively widening, trading higher, indicating that there's more economic and um, economic strength, cyclical strength on the horizon, right? Potentially inflationary cyclical strength on the horizon. So when we finally got to this point of seeing headline inflation in the CPI data, those market-based readings really flared up. So they went from sort of having slow regular ascents to kind of spasming at the highs and carving new highs, right? But what happens in that situation when you've got the markets sort of breathing heavily due to the CPI number is you have the VIX explode, right? Everybody says, whoa, if this headline, if this headline inflation is going to be with us, eventually is going to bite into the consumer's pocket. And that could eventually be a weakening factor for the S&P. Consider right. right now, Ash, one of the top, you know, the top performing sector of the S&P 2021 is retail, right? So it's fair to be a little bit concerned if the consumer has a big bite coming out of his pocket now from inflationary forces, perhaps the retail investor or the retail buyer, excuse me, gets slowed down a little bit. So that's the thought process in the fear of the markets kind of curling over and having a very steep two day sell off. Right. Right. So what we've been observing for the entire bull market is that. During this secular bull market, when we have steep sell-offs with intense selling in equities, where the VIX perks up usually above 25, we have the tick index, which measures the intensity of selling, register extreme low prints, usually bigger than minus 1,500 on the downside, right? That would be considered an extreme low tick index usually coincidental with the S&P knifing lower 10, 20, 30 handles at a clip, right? That's when everybody is indiscriminately hitting bids, right? Nobody's being cute. They're executing orders, right? right? So what happened was we had this historical tick index number of minus 2,069 that followed that inflation number, which means that everybody looked at the number, looked at the S&P and said sold. Right. Essentially, everybody said, we're up here at the highs in equities. Let's take some off the table and see what happens in the wake of this CPI number. Right. right. We have 
bonds fell off to their lows with yields perking right back to the highs, right? Inflationary signals. We have the dollar this week nosediving through a really important trend line for my purposes. The dollar index broke down through, I think it was 90 and a quarter or so and proceeded even lower to an 89 handle now. So this weakness in the dollar is being brought about by the market expecting more inflation, obviously weakening the purchasing power of the dollar. And since then, we've seen strength in commodities, which is the trade that we've been preaching for a year now. And so that's kind of what's working its way through the tape this week, right? We had a pullback from the highs around 42.50 or so in the S&P, pulled back about 150 points. We're last at 41 and a quarter, Ash, to get you up to speed in the, uh, you know, the real world capital markets. And it feels like to me that we're going to probably put that sell event from last week in the rearview mirror. Yeah. Right. We're, we're still back in this we're still back in this dynamic where I wake up every morning and at the top of my leaderboard from overnight trading is two base metals and crude oil, right? Or two base metals and corn, or sometimes it's unleaded gas, jet fuel, and soybean, right? So every day we've got like a new commodity reacting to, you know, the weaker dollar, the inflationary forces of continued stimulus here in the U.S. And so what I think is that the market got shaken up a little bit by headline inflation. The market took it in stride, a heavy two days of selling. We bounced off the 50-day moving average in the S&P. And it feels like we might be able to get back on the run again, especially if we're led again by natural resources. Now, there's a few flies in the ointment today. But broadly speaking, I think that's what's going on with the tape, Ash. Yeah, you know, that's extremely well said. Unpacking that narrative, that's the TikTok going back to last week. Let me ask you this, what are some of those moderating influences that you saw that made you less concerned about the CPI number? Great, great question, Ash. Well, you know, as soon as, what was very interesting about the destruction during the CPI number was that there was no clear rotation. It was everything down. The leading sectors of the market, right, energy, home builders, down. Um, some of the lagging sectors of the market, technology down, everything was across the board, yeah. right? So once that shotgun scatter what made its way through the markets and we got back to more orderly trading, what we saw already a few times, both last week and this week, is a repetition of that pattern where all the natural resources sectors are up at the top of the leaderboard and technology is at the bottom of the leaderboard, back into what I call the reopening rotation. Yeah. Right? If you remember, we went from that lockdown rotation into the reopening rotation, and right. I feel like that's what we're seeing signs of today, where crude oil is getting back on its feet after a couple of negative headlines. We had a few inventory builds, et cetera, et cetera. Crude oil right back to the highs. You know, base metals back off their highs with the inflation number. Next thing you know, you know, they're right back to the highs. So it doesn't feel like the commodity buyers are done just yet. And I feel like that can get the tape sort of back on its feet. If you ask me, I think the S&P rally is going to stay intact after this episode. Yeah, it's so interesting to hear you talk about this rotation, the one that we saw, obviously, from uh, growth to value and then ping ponging back again, thinking about the way the pros think about this within different classes in the equity market itself. It's a fascinating open topic. It is because there's major inflection points, Ash. Now, you just mentioned a really important one, growth, uh, you know, the, the transition from growth back to value now, right? All of this is transpiring as yields are bottoming, coming out of a trough and turning higher, right? You're seeing things like suddenly value perform again over growth. You're seeing things like momentum stocks go nowhere. Momentum stocks, the ETF, MTUM, tell me where you think it is on the year, 2021. Just take a guess. Momentum stocks, Ash. Momentum, bro. I would guess, I would guess huge bounces. That's what I would guess. I guess it, I guess it's close to flat. I'm not looking. I'd guess close to flat, but it's doing this to get there. Right. It's flat on the year. Right. Yeah. So if you came into the year looking to be long gung ho, the momentum stocks, right? The the technology, the innovation, things like that, you are sucking on a big donut so far in terms of performance this year. So right. that's a major trend change. And when you see the tectonic plates underneath the market, like we just mentioned, growth versus value, looking at momentum stocks and sort of the whole conception change, now all of a sudden we've got the S&P starting to outperform the NASDAQ, right? 
So this is a sort of dynamic that's changing, telling me that the S&P can continue higher without technology. We can have technology flat. Like I go over these things all the time, Ash. Let's look at, let's just go over this right now while we're, while we're talking about yeah. annual performance, right? We've got essentially energy up out in the lead, right? XOP, OIH, XLE are all up north of 40% this year, right? In the lead, we've got retail, which is up 45%, okay? Then we've got XME, industrial metals and mining up 40%, home builders up 20%, banks up 26%, transports up 25%, right? This is the commodity trade saying it's on like Donkey Kong, right? Look at what's flat on the year to down, software, right? We just went through a five year period where software right. was eating the world. Now all of a sudden it's down on the year. Cybersecurity, biotech, cloud storage down on the year. Man, if you Amazing. can't see the, right? If you can't see the trend change going on in this equity market, you're holding the newspaper upside down. <laughs> Amazing, though, to think about it, that those are down on the year or flat momentum stocks. So interesting, you know, to think about this and the point you made so well said five years going into it. Look, and this is uh, something if these are up massively over five year time horizons, it all depends on your time horizon. It all depends on how you're trading it. Such an important point, something that I think uh, investors across the board need to think about. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and the most the most important thing um, that I want to just continue to pound the table on is the most important thing investors have to think about is shaping their portfolio or making sure that their portfolio is starting to get more and more shaped for an inflationary atmosphere for the next five to 10 years. Because it feels like it's another one of those situations where before the dot-com bubble burst, the Federal Reserve didn't see any signs of excess. Before the great financial crisis hit and the mortgage bubble burst, you know, um, Greenspan didn't see any signs of excesses there. Now we've got Jerome Powell calling this inflation, which the numbers of performance are blinding at this point in terms of where these commodities are on the year or off of the March lows. He's calling that transitory. It feels like we are headed for another massive central banking error. So I would like to just emphasize to my clients and readers, and that that's the way that I'm going with my portfolio, and read the Morning Navigator if you want to follow that path. <laughs> yeah, well said. So much to say there, but two big questions come up for me. Uh, so number one, uh, first, as you described the setup, what's the positioning, talking about the inflation trade? And number two, unpack a little bit. You're talking about the commodity price inflation. This is a story that you were on to, geez, uh, I guess back in, uh, in 2020, we started talking about this, having this conversation. Uh, explain a little bit about the distinction between commodity price inflation and the kind of inflation that we saw in core X food and energy CPI last week. Oh, that's a good one, Ash. So let, let's address that one first, and then we'll, we'll go back to your first question, which you may have, I may ask you to repeat. But if I remember it. Yeah, that's exactly. So let's keep going. We're live without a net here. So the commodity, um, the commodity performance has been blinding, right? We have seen since the Federal Reserve and Treasury have taken this stance of stimulus to fix the problems, right? What we've seen, broadly speaking, is a weakening dollar in very orderly fashion and exploding commodities in not very orderly fashion, right? If you see the grain markets, if you look at the metals markets, they are changing on cue to almost vertical trading. And they're really just, like we said, expressing that looking like the biggest economy in the G10 is looks like it's intentionally weakening its currency with all of the stimulus and all the borrowing that's taking place to get us out of this lockdown economically. So I think that that weight on the dollar is causing a massive, you know, we're starting to see this portfolio shift toward hard assets. You know, the tape doesn't lie every day, like we've been saying, with the hard commodities rallying and the tech stuff sort of lying at unchanged. This is the sec these are the sectors that people have been long for a long time and need to rotate out of, right? Most recently this week, you're seeing gold metals and mining break out, right? The gold miners just broke their, fifth, uh, excuse me, 200-day moving average to the upside. They broke out ahead of gold, which followed it through the 200-day moving average. These are the inflation trades that sort of sag the early part of the year coming back to life when headline inflation hits. So the headline inflation, Ash, as you know, is really the government authorities trying to hide as much real inflation as they can. 
Notice that we don't really count, um, you know, healthcare costs and education costs in the CPI data. And then you get into X food and energy and you have a number that has been very clearly and very carefully engineered not to show much inflation, right? They're taking out the food and energy component. You've still got almost 1% inflation in that sector on a monthly basis. And that's a little bit too much for the bond market to handle at this level right now. Yeah. I'll tell you a story, Tony. Uh, years ago, when I worked uh, for Nouriel Roubini at Roubini Global Economics downtown on Broadway, I had this little office, and directly in front of my little office, there was a guy uh, who sat at a desk directly in front of my door, and he was an economist. And, you know, when you get to work with Nouriel Roubini, they're the smartest economists in the world. It was great to work around these guys, tremendous learning experience. One day, I walked out of my little office, and there had just been a print. I forget whether it was GDP or CPI or PPI, but it was an outlier. It was a real change from the month before. And I walked out and I said, what, what, what's going on? And he said, let me show you something. And I sat down at his desk and he said, you see this chart right here? And I said, yes. He said, that's a three month rolling average. That's what we look at as economists. You market guys, you news guys, you freak out about stuff. Sometimes the prints come back crazy. There's any number of factors that could influence it. And it was really interesting the way that he explained it to me. And I, of course, joked back with him, well, yeah, that's great. You have the luxury to think about it. The guys who are trading these markets don't. They need to make decisions in seconds, right? In yeah. Minutes. Uh, yeah. But it is a really interesting perspective on how you think about when you get an outlier print, for example. You know, His response would be, well, don't worry about it. Ignore it. If you see it three months in a row, then you've got something that looks like a trend. Now, that brings us back to what you were saying about commodities. Commodities price inflation is precisely that. It is something that is broader. It is something that is durable. It is not a one-off uh, situation. It is something that we have seen, you've been watching, and we've seen ample evidence that this phenomenon is real and it is moving in one direction. Dude, I mean, we went from two and a quarter at the pump to north of $3 since Joe Biden has been elected. I mean, that is, uh, you know, I don't know how to say it any you know more clearly. It is happening right in front of our faces in everything. And how long, you know, the price of oil, as we know, you know, between the oil and the products that contribute go into literally everything that we buy, right? You, we've had this conversation before. Yeah. All the plastics, you know, all of the byproducts of the oil market are all over the place. And so, you know, that stuff is going to filter out into the next set of visible price bumps, right? Right now, it's very visible at the pump. Two and a quarter to three and a quarter. Um, you know, nobody asking the Biden uh, administration any questions about why this is going on, right? I think it's feel like it's very obvious that shutting the pipeline down, followed by a colonial um, pipeline hack, that's going to put upper pressure on the price of energy. And so now, you know, in addition to talking about raising taxes, we're getting taxed on the inflation side of every equation and every grocery bill. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that leads me to believe that there may be more stimulus coming down the road to address any kind of economic weakness that might be having trouble handling these higher prices. So you got to think creatively here during the Biden administration, Ash. Yeah, exactly. And look, you know, I, I, I full disclosure, I have not had a driver's license for about five years. I let it expire. And then I realized I had to go and take the written test again. And so I haven't done it. But look, I'm looking at a chart on gasoline prices. We're looking at virtually doubling. Uh, from about a buck uh, seventy uh, up to over three dollars uh, since uh, the depths of the crisis. I mean, this is extraordinary movement. You ain't seen nothing yet. There's a story out today, Ash, where the IEA is talking about ending all new drilling projects. Right? There's also a coincidence. You know, this is what's got CVX and Exxon down four percent and three percent today, respectively. Right? There's been a big rally in energy stocks over the last several weeks. Um, they closed on their highs yesterday and very conspicuously retreated in large magnitudes from the highs today. Um, that is in direct response to the idea that they will be potentially IEA calling for the ending of drilling projects. That may send the stocks lower for now, but that is bullish the price of gasoline, yeah. right? Because we're still all lining up at the pump every Monday to get gassed up for the week. Um, you know, none of that really bodes well for a pullback in energy prices at all. There's another rumor going around on FinTwit that the Biden administration is going to try to block all new fossil fuel investment, which seems like another, you know, total, total, you know, Overton window green economy headline to try to open your mind a little bit. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, I, I, if, if this type of thing becomes any more of a headline reality, you're going to see oil in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and it's going to happen very quickly. The next time you go fill up at the tank, it's going to be five bucks a gallon. Yeah, it seems to me kind of, you know, the, a metaphor for what we were talking about earlier, there's, there's, a, there's a time horizon disconnect here in this, right? Everybody wants green energy, right? I don't think there's anybody in the world who says, I'm opposed to green energy, right? I want a world where we're totally off fossil fuels, 100%, not burning a single fossil fuel. I want a world with no pipelines running through anybody's backyard, right? right. But how do you get there? The reality is that where we are today is that we are totally dependent on fossil fuels, right? And when it comes to these conversations, and I and I understand some of this is politicians have to say certain things in order to get elected, but the reality is you get things that are wildly mispriced based on these perception gyrations relative to things that people are saying in the public policy sphere that this isn't about politics. At the end of the day, what it's about is physics, right? It's about physics and economics. Right now, there's a certain degree of energy density, you know, per uh, centimeter squared that you can get out of fossil fuels, and it's much higher than where you can get out of it with green energy. Now, I think it'd be great if we invested in this, if we did amazing R&D. By the way, I think it should be something that America leads the world in. Who wouldn't love that? Who wouldn't love great American companies to profit from? But Fossil fuels, gasoline, it's not going away tomorrow. It's not going away next year. There needs to be a way to produce this energy. There needs to be a way to transport it. And there needs to be a way to distribute it. And just in the short term, the people at the end of the day who are looking at the price, who are looking at the signal that comes from price, have to see this. I know you do. Tell me, what are people thinking? That's such a, that was really well set up, Ash. You know, it, it's like, it, it's like, you know, you're talking about something that we're trying to accomplish that I would agree with you. I would love to see the U.S. be the world leader Absolutely. in right in, in wind and solar. I would love to live in a house with a solar roof that powers my battery wall that I plug my car into and I never have to stop and get gas. Dream world. Great Total dream world. Could not, could not agree more. The problem is we have, it doesn't seem politically like the people imposing this the strongest are willing to have a transition, a sensible transition period, right? Now, if you want to go about this the right way, you know, knowing how much we've got to accomplish, you would say, okay, look, this is going to take us a century, right? This is going to be the long haul, the long game, and that's what we're going to have to play. But the administration likes to say, carbon neutral by 2030. Right. Is anybody taking that date down? Is anybody going to interview Joe Biden? I had in 2030 to see if that came true. Nobody is going to be able to do that. He's not going to be here, right? So that's the disconnect that you speak about, right? It's like, I, I just wish they would stop setting abrupt deadlines that right. are spiking costs away from us right. of the energy that we have to consume energy, uh, that we have to consume en anyway, and say, this is a long haul. We're going to make this adjustment very, very slowly. So it's the least painless thing for the country, right? There's no way that... You pouring gallons of gas, throwing uh, planes in the air and millions of drivers on the road and going from 50% wind and solar to 50% wind and solar capacity. Right. We're just not going to do that in 10 years. So like you said, um, it, it's outrageous for the commodity markets to try to conjure. And I think that that's why you've got base metals literally trading almost parabolic, trying to get out ahead of all of the needs in, in industrial metal we're going to need to build all the battery packs and the wind farms and everything that we're going to need to get the green economy going. So right. that's what you're, you're seeing is the economy, um, the commodity markets are definitely kind of spasming ahead of that, you know, dr massive demand drive. I mean, Ash, yeah. we're going into this green movement with copper at a bid and all time high. Spreads are tight. Supplies are limited. Right. And, and now we need a massive supply at a low cost. So the exact right. opposite thing is going on. And so that's why I feel like yeah. we need to sort of take our foot off the gas, no pun intended, <laughs> on the green energy movement, if, if, uh, if I may. Well, you know, the thing about it is that if you think about American politicians of either party, right, I don't want to pick on anybody here, they're elected for two, four and six year terms at the national level. When you think about what the other side of that supply and demand curve is the supply curve. And when you think about what it takes to actually extract energy from the ground, to pull copper out of the ground. This is decades-long investment in infrastructure. You talk to someone in an energy company, 
Uh, you talk to someone at an oil company, they're thinking in 10 year time horizons in terms of how they deploy capacity to extract. Uh, and it is a very complex problem. And like with everything else in 2021, the age of Facebook, the age of social media, right? We get bumper stickers. You get 30 second sound bites for problems that really need to be solved. I guess the good news is while it may be bad for the world and bad for the country, it's great for traders because what it does is it causes these gyrations. I can see the chart over your left shoulder. We get a lot of charts that look like that, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, this is this is uh, you know for the man in the trading arena, this is all good news. You know, I mean, you're able to trade, you know, bull and bull market energy, bull market base metals, bull market grains. I mean, this is a playground for an old commodity trader like me. Unfortunately, yeah. you know, this is the stuff that's going to hit the country right in the wallet. You know, all, all the costs that are going up, the um, initial raw material input costs are going to get passed right down to the consumer. That's going to cause a little pain at some level. But, you know, it seems like this is the way the market's going. And that's why I say, Ash, the only battle that we can wage against this is to make moves in our personal account and try to protect ourselves, right? Try to hedge out some of the commodity inflation that we're yeah. going to see by being long, you know, um, securities like DBC and DBA, you know, agricultural or commodity ETFs, um, you know, that will appreciate greatly alongside your grocery bill. So this is why, you know, I feel like I, I stress to everybody I speak to is, you know, the beginning of the phone call is, is your portfolio prepared for more inflation, which means, you know, sort of subtly, are you out of bonds and are you in the right sectors of the stock market, sort of in natural resources and out of technology? So that's the elevator pitch for are you prepared for commodity inflation? Yeah, by the way, Tony, you just answered question one that we both forgot from 15 minutes ago, which was, that's the setup, how do you react? And there's your answer. There you go, we came full circle, that's perfect. It all comes full circle. Uh, Tony, I have to ask you something we were talking about earlier. Uh, you mentioned, uh, I think your uh, phrase that we were offline is that Bitcoin has been a soup sandwich. What is going on? What are your thoughts there? We've been very patient with Bitcoin. We've been very patient with the laser-eyed community, right? We, we've taken a lot of shots across the bow as, you know, old-world asset class traders. And it's come up in time for the laser-eyed guys, right? We saw all of the sentiment tops. We saw five sentimental topping signals where markets can usually only handle one, right? We saw Elon Musk go Bitcoin. We saw the uh, $70 million JPEG sell at auction. Uh, we saw the Miami Heat rename the arena after the uh, Bitcoin um, exchange. We saw just about everything you could see that lent itself to hubris and excess in the cryptocurrency market, right? Now we've got Elon Musk tongue-tying himself to Dogecoin and to Bitcoin and to Tesla. And so now that his credibility is facing a real come to Jesus moment with all of the accidents that are going on in the electronic vehicles that are supposed to be automated around the world, his credibility is slipping and he's pulling the credibility of cryptocurrency down with it. I honestly think that's what's going on. I also think there's a slight undertone of, I'm, I'm not gonna call it a coincidence that gold is back to breaking out again after suffering four or five months of pullbacks while crypto is curling over. So it kind of goes back to my original theory that nobody liked, that people were piling out of gold and into crypto, you know, at 40K and 50K and 60K. So now I'm getting a little bit of sort of, you know, I'm getting a little bit of cred for that call because now gold is breaking out in pretty large magnitude fashion and Bitcoin closing below 43k today as we speak ash the 200 day moving average is a couple of thousand bucks away i would imagine that the hodlers haven't sold anything because they hodl and we're going to get a real gut check on their ability to stomach huge drawdowns from the highs right we're already 30 percent off the highs in crypto you ask anybody that's been trading for a long time what does that mean 30 percent off the highs bear market it means it means bear market. So we're going to see if the crypto people, you know, are able to mount a buying attack on the dip here and see what happens. But I'm telling you, if it curls over below the 200 day moving average, a lot of the institutions that piled in late are going to say, get me out of this thing. Yeah. And, th and then we're going to see what the laser eyed people are made of.
<laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. First of all, the laser-eyed people, they are my people, so I'm not going I to... I love them all. Here's the thing. Look, there, there's this... Interestingly enough, for people who are outside the space, uh, there is definitely... Um, it's, it's, it's an interesting space internally because there's a lot of, uh, let's just say, um, impassioned discussions between the people who are on the Bitcoin side and the people who are on the altcoin side. Uh, to me, that's one of the most fundamental aspects uh, of the space. Something really interesting that you may not know about is that right now, something called BDI, that's the Bitcoin Dominance Index. And what this tracks is the percentage of market capitalization held by Bitcoin uh, versus everything else. That is now uh, at a low that we haven't seen uh, since since twenty uh, since twenty eighteen. Uh, it is now down to thirty nine point three percent. So less than forty percent of the total market value of the entire cryptocurrency complex is now in Bitcoin. That's a big deal. That's something we haven't seen for a long time. Now, obviously, the maximalists uh, see this as very much a buying opportunity. They very much believe in the long term uh, proposition. I was just looking at some data from uh, Rect Capital. Uh, this, these retracements down below, down 30 to 40 percent. There are a lot of them. There have been five retracements uh, since 2017 uh, that have been that deep. So this is something that we know is an incredibly volatile asset. It's an incredibly volatile asset class. I don't think this surprises anyone. You know, for me, and it's a very different thing um, than what we've been talking about here, which is how to trade price action. Is I look at this as there's a phrase, I think it's John Burbank in this space, price is a liar. Uh, and the price is the price in the short term. The, that is all there is when you're trading, uh, whether you're a swing trader, a day trader, you're thinking about things on a shorter time horizon. But in the long term, it's a very different scenario. Uh, and that obviously facilitates a very different necessary mindset uh, the way you think about it. I am consistently, and if I wanted to just zoom the camera up to the 50,000 foot level, uh, I'm just consistently impressed by the degree of thoughtful, smart, interesting people in this space. And this is one that's just fresh in my mind uh, because I did it today. But I did an interview earlier today with a gentleman named Mance Harmon, uh, who's the CEO of Hedera Hashgraph. Now, Hedera Hashgraph, interestingly enough, it's not a blockchain. It's a technology that's very similar to blockchains. The superset, they call them DLTs, digital ledger technologies. It's a type of technology that's very similar to blockchain. But, but is different. This is a really smart guy. Uh, he ran the missile defense program for the U.S. government at the Missile Defense Agency. Uh, his partner and co-founder is a uh, you know guy who also has deep ties to the military uh, and intelligence community. He was uh, the person who came up with hash graphs, this DLT type technology, a gentleman named Lehman Baird, a PhD mathematician, uh, computer programmer. These are really smart thoughtful people. In this case, they've been doing this for, I think, about a decade. They've been working on this project in varying uh, permutations. They're not guys who just jumped into it because the you know somebody sold a $70 million uh, NFT. These are people who are very serious, who are very thoughtful, have long track records uh, in the military uh, establishment here in the United States, who really see an opportunity for a phase shift in the way that we do commerce, in the way that we do banking and the way that we do financial services in America, in the world. These are not trends that are going away today or tomorrow. You know, Elon Musk is going to tweet today, tomorrow. He's going to say some fun, interesting, provocative things. He's going to get some hallelujahs. He's going to piss people off. That is not ultimately about where the space is going to be five years from now or 10 years from now. Now, if you're trading these markets, right, everything that I just said is completely irrelevant to you. You don't care. You care about the price. You care about what happened over the weekend. But when you're taking a bit of a broader perspective, it really is something uh, that is very clear, uh, a trend that's durable, and it is one that I would never bet against as a trend. Now, the price of any, any particular coin on any particular day, who knows? Twitter. Ask Twitter what's going to happen. Ash, I like that assessment of it. I really like that assessment of it because I don't want to come off as being anti-Bitcoin in any right. way. I'm positive Bitcoin. It's something that I want to root for. I mean, you know, a decentralized currency right up my alley. You know what I mean? I, I am off zero exposure to Bitcoin, right? So I am an owner in small, tiny capacity. And at the same time, I think the price and what's happened with price action has been utterly ridiculous and observably folly. 
right? It's, it's been an observable folly for a lot of what's gone on at, at you know, uh, some of the things that we've seen in the highs are just absolutely unbelievable. So, you know, some of the froth has to come off. I have no doubt that it'll find a level and rally again. I do think it's probably going to struggle to get through 65K if it breaks down through the 200 day, which remains to be seen yet, right? That's a battle that we haven't even fought yet with Bitcoin. So we'll see what happens. You know, I'm just here to follow the trend, to follow it as it elbows its way into the macro landscape as a real inflation hedge. And, you know, like I've said to a lot of people in my Slack channel, you know, I don't want to be the one that gets caught bearish Bitcoin if the S&P continues to rotate like I think it's going to with natural resources in the lead and technology stocks selling off, because I don't think that's necessarily a bearish scenario for Bitcoin at all. I think yeah. that's a bullish scenario for Bitcoin. So, you know, that's that's where I am on it, Ash. I play both sides of the coin. I like to piss off the laser eye guys because it's fun and they deserve it. And at the same time, I'm a believer. I like to believe in it and watch good things develop in the space. I really do. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. I'm looking right now at the chat window for our YouTube session right now, and I'm seeing HBAR. That's Hedera Hashgraph. I'm seeing ADA. Uh, that is uh, Charles Hoskinson's Cardano, who we've interviewed on the platform. I'm seeing ALGO. Uh, that is uh, Sil uh, um, uh, Silvio Macaulay's uh, ALGO Rand coin. It's so interesting to me to see that the people who are watching this show, quite frankly, are so far ahead of what you're hearing on the financial networks right now. And that's a signal. That's telling you something. It's telling you when the people who are watching our show and who are interacting with us on YouTube are so far ahead of the narrative that you're reading uh, in the Wall Street Journal or, and I'm not going to name any names, but on the financial news networks, it's not even close. This is something that's happening here. It's disruptive. Uh, it is going to be a game changer in the space, how it plays out, what the time frame is, what the mechanics are, open questions. But man, this is something that it's, I just think it's impossible to be bearish about. Yeah, Ash, I agree. I, you know, we're like we're like the Bitcoin of financial television, right? Unconflicted. You know, it, it, we're we're we just trade on the tape where we trade honest opinions, and uh, that's all you're going to get out of us, right? So that seems to be what Bitcoin is trying to establish itself as an unconflicted currency in the macro world. And, I, and like I said, I'm all for it. I don't need to go so heavy on the Bitcoin bulls, even though it's coming apart like a soup sandwich. <laughs> we got to have you debate one at some point on Real Vision. That would be a lot of fun. I don't know if I'm up for that. <laughs> I really don't. I really don't think that I can. So it won't stop me from trying. Listen, talking about uh, speaking truth, we've got a lot of questions that are coming in. Uh, I know we don't have a ton of time left, so maybe we can hit through these, uh, do them almost like a speed round here, because uh, we get a lot of questions, and I really, really want to get to them. Uh, so the Go. first one comes to us from Mario G. Uh, if inflation continues up and the Fed keeps rates low, what are your thoughts on tips? Hmm. You know, I, I don't know enough about the bond market to decide which is going to be the right investment to be in, whether it's tips, uh, you know, TLT, you know, I would, I'm assuming treasury inflation protected security sounds like it's going to be the way to go if we head into an inflationary environment. Um, but like I said, I'm not a master of the bond market and, and I can't tell you if that is the best possible fixed income investment in a perfectly inflationary scenario, Mario. I, I, I want to just contest that right away. Yeah, the, the the mechanics of those markets are obviously very complicated, and and uh, it is it is true what you say. It's a it's a challenging one. Okay, I just lost my questions window here. I'll have to find it. Uh, I'll have to find it in a second. Uh, but let's. Uh, there there was there was one that I saw coming in uh, to ask Tony what you think about about Coinbase. Obviously, the stock has gotten hammered a bit lately. Any thoughts there? Yeah, I'm a big fan of following tech IPOs like Coinbase that I can kind of get a handle on, you know, where their position is in the market and where the value of their product is at the time. So I actually have, have consciously told investors that I would hold off on Coinbase just until this episode plays out in Bitcoin. And that's kind of where I am and the best advice I could give right now with Bitcoin testing the 200 DMA. Like, this is a very binary event for me, I think, because we know that we've got a market that's long out the wazoo, right? There's everybody in the world's got some kind of exposure to Bitcoin at this point, um, the laser eyes notwithstanding, new institutions notwithstanding. And a breakdown through that level is going to mean a severe hit to cryptocurrency market cap. It's likely temporary. And I think that that is the kind of breakdown that I would like to buy the Coinbase IPO into. 
something where it's starting to probe new lows that nobody knows where it's going to sort of bottom out. And that's where I would start putting a little bits of money into it on a breakdown, sort of not knowing where the breakdown was going to stop, but knowing that at some point Bitcoin is going to get back on its feet again. And, you know, there'll be periods of time in the future that are inflationary that we can count on Bitcoin probably trading, you know, higher and performing well. So Coinbase, I'm looking for a big dump in Bitcoin to put my first dollar in Coinbase. And the stock is absolutely on my radar. I haven't touched it yet. And I've been waving people off until we get this battle at the 200 day over. Great. I got my question stock back. That one came to us uh, from Jay Smoke. Um, right on. So moving on, uh, this is an interesting question uh, from Echoing Al. If inflation makes commodities more attractive, won't this have the potential to dry out liquidity and hence drive commodity prices down in the longer term? Um, I don't see any scenario where liquidity is pulled from financial markets in any kind of dry up scenario. Right. I don't think I, I think the opposite of dry up when the Fed's balance sheet goes from four to seven point eight trillion. And I think the opposite of dry up when money supply is up twenty five percent in a year like last year, um, you know, when it usually grows single digit percents in a year. So what we've just seen is massive liquidity put into the markets. What we continue to see, despite the fact that the economy is improving and the markets have recovered, are central banks providing liquidity, right? We're still buying mortgage-backed securities at um, you know the pace of 120 billion a month. No signs of letting up on that. I mean, I just can't even picture a scenario where liquidity dries up and commodities back off right now. There, a lot more has to happen before we get to that scenario. Yeah. Here's another uh, skeptical one, Tony. Almost to the same point. Uh, this one comes to us from uh, Slight Kia. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, isn't the inflation trade uh, due for a pause? Does Tony care about mean reversion? I expect it's a similar answer. No, it's fine. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like, do you care about overbought stochastics as a trader, right? It's like if you're long something and it's going up and stochastics are overbought, does that make you sell it, right? And that, that's my point is this trade is going in one direction right now. And, yeah, of course, there's going to be mean reversions along the way. Those that's not the trade that I look to play at all. Right. I don't not one time during this next several months will you see me try to pick a top in a commodity looking to profit from the pullback. I would much rather sit here and be flat commodities and watching them praying for a meaningful pullback. For example, pullbacks into moving averages in either the grains or the base metals or precious metals markets would be a huge buy signal to me. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really looking at it like, you know, like, like the inflation beast is just getting going to get turned off because prices are too high. Stochastics can run oversold, excuse me, stochastics can run overbought for 10 years and a security can quintuple in that time frame. Just the way copper going through 10K and going up 800 bucks on the breakout through that number. I mean, I don't know where the top of the commodity is, and the other problem is I can't see the end of the line of the people that are online waiting to buy the commodities, right? The line is wrapped around the door now. We're going to need commodities for the new housing secular movement, the new um, green economy. I mean, commodities are bid only right now, and they don't fall from the sky. So I'm wondering, you know, I don't know how to play pullbacks in parabolic markets that have got dwindling supply and a long list of buyers. That's just the way I look at things. Yeah, interesting. Very interesting. Uh, here's one that comes just from Steve. Uh, any follow-up thoughts on the bullish call on marijuana stocks? What are your thoughts there, and how are they evolving? Yeah, I'm. You know, I'm still secularly bullish the sector. As in, in ten years from now, I think it's going to be a multiple of where it's trading right now. Um, I my my axe has been that cannabis very clearly has been challenged since yields turned from being flat to negative to you know, being in inflationary higher yield mode, right? I know that all of the good news that we could possibly ask for in cannabis is likely on the tape, right? Mm -hmm. We're anticipating, you know, we, we're anticip we've got so many more states legalizing. We're anticipating safe banking coming across the tape. There's enough good news out there. You know, there's stars galore, you know, opening up cannabis companies. There's enough good news out there that, you know, we've had everything built into the markets. 
then all of a sudden we have this yield rise as cannabis companies are getting their first look at legal capital. So, you know, they were just calculating on getting free capital as, as they, you know, progress into getting legal capital. And now they're talking about 1.75% over 10 years, yields likely going higher. I think that that's sort of holding the momentum of cannabis back right now. So mm. until these companies start to outperform from an earnings perspective again, I think they're going to struggle in, in, in a higher rate environment. Plus, there's a little bit of a nasty technical formation at the top of the MSOS chart, which is the US MSOs. We just saw a head and shoulders top put into that. We broke the neckline and now we've kind of been sagging ever since. So I think there'll be a steeper pullback and then we'll get back on our feet in cannabis. Yeah, these are the multi-state operators. These are the large companies that are playing in multiple states from production and, uh, and distribution perspectives. Uh, here's one that comes to us from Tom W. Uh, Tony, where do you see the price of gold heading? I mean, I'm bullish. I've gotten extremely bullish over the last 48 hours, call it, you know, as gold and gold miners have exceeded their 200 day moving average. So um, I'm not a gold bug, but I am bullish gold now that it is coming out of a sort of three to six month period where we pulled back from the highs. Total gold ETF assets have gone from about above 110 million to below 100 million. I think that's where the trade starts to level off. And I think especially now that we see some more weakness in cryptocurrency, we are going to see some strength in the barbarous relic called gold. And I'm really, really bullish, actually, about the pattern that it just put in below the moving averages just in the first quarter of this year. I think that that could be the launching pad for the rest of the year. So I'm bullish gold, and I think we test the highs pretty soon. Yeah. We're getting near to the end here in terms of time. This is absolutely blown by. There's a great question from David here that I know we're not going to get a chance to answer, but Tony, we got to put a, put a pin in this sure. one. It's great. The question from David is, and this is a longer term question, but I want to ask this in advance. What is Tony's bread and butter time frame for his trades? How does he allocate for his portfolios in terms of duration, uh, positions and trades? Uh, and how do you time the trades? This is a great question. We'll have to do that maybe next week. Talk a little bit more. About this. That guy should know that I have a trading apprentice program that he can call me up, Tony, at TG Macro, and we can talk privately about it. Or we can go over the two second quick and dirty here, Ash, whichever you like. Let's do the two second quick and dirty. Okay. The idea is my ideal time frame on the beginning of it is two days to two weeks on my trades, right? When I get into something, I've got a reasonable risk reward and it usually plays out where I get stopped out or the trade starts going my way over two days to two weeks. Now, the reality is when a trade works out really well, I'm a trailing stop loss guy. So I just keep bumping my stop loss closer to the markets. And that's how I stay in trades longer than two weeks. If it keeps going my way, I keep bumping up the stop. Eventually, the market curls over and takes me out for a profit. But that's the quick and dirty on the first half of that answer, Ash, if that's fair. Fantastic. And we'll do more of that in the future. Tony, as we get to the end here, we've covered a lot of topics. Final takeaways for the viewers. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see the equity markets and commodity markets get back into rally mode. I'm waiting for the dollar to have a nasty nosedive into new lows uh, for the year that will eventually tick the dollar negative on the year. If you remember, the dollar ended last year on a dead ball low. So now we're just getting back to the dollar being unchanged and going negative. And I think that that's going to develop into one of the big stories of 2021 is how badly the dollar was damaged as Biden just lopped on trillion dollar stimulus plans. And so I'm watching for that to pan out, and I'm watching for the commodity trade to get back on its feet. I think we survived a little bit of a scare on headline inflation number. But guess what? The next time the market sees headline inflation like that, it's not going to be as scared. So that's why I think the S&P can stay on this trajectory, and I'm still bull market trading like a wild beast. Yeah, well said and well summarized. DXY now under 90 here today, 89 spots, 79. Victory is ours, Ash. <laughs> Tony, now I got to say something that I haven't said in a long time. I got to jump on the six train to get downtown and go out for dinner. Oh, what a dream. Back out yeah. to dinner, beautiful night in New York City. Enjoy that, Ash. That's going to feel good. Getting back to life, right? Oh, man. Dreamy, dreamy. I wish I could join you. That sounds fantastic. Beautiful night for it, too. Always such a pleasure, Tony. This was a great one, uh, and I'm glad we got to do it. Fantastic, Ash. I'll see you in two weeks. Absolutely. And thanks for watching everyone. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for the participation. We'll see you soon. Uh...